please uh, take your seat. We are going to start again in a minute. Okay, so after the morning on quantum gravity, it's the time to shift to quantum information. We are going to have the introduction of quantum information uh, um, by Flaminia Giacomini of uh, Perimeter Institute. And let me also take the opportunity to thank Flaminia, who has been one of the main organizers of this conference. So instead of clapping in the end, we can also have a first clapping <laughs> to begin with. And thank you, and thank you for the trust. <laughs> so, uh, wait. Okay, great. Okay, so it's it's really nice to be here again in person with all of you. And so, this in this in the next two hours, what I plan to do is to give a very broad overview and touch on different themes that are, uh, be, are being addressed by several parts of the com quantum information community of KIST. I will not be exhaustive. I will not go into details of each of the themes, but my goal is to rather give you a general picture that will then allow you to just fill in the technical details whenever you happen to read some literature on the topics that I'm going to talk about. So first of all, can you all hear me? Yeah? Okay. Good. So, we call it quantum information, but just to be clear, like, we actually use quantum information tools, so it's not a standard, really, quantum information approach. And so, some people would prefer maybe to refer to that as quantum foundations. And the first thing that comes to our mind when we say quantum foundations is usually interpretations of quantum theory. But actually, this is not what most of the community quantum foundations is thinking about. There are other themes. And here, I, I was trying to think what characterizes this type of approach. And in the end, I came up with, with a list which is personal. Maybe not everybody would agree with that. But I just want to tell you what I mean when I'm, I'm saying that this is a quantum, that we use quantum information tools in quantum foundations. So what I mean, okay, <laughs> no. Okay, <laughs> okay, I, is, are these three points, uh, device independent thinking, operational approach, and first principles. What do I mean? So device-independent thinking is something that we draw from Bell's theorem. The reason, and Wayne will tell us more about that later. Uh, but I, I, would, I will push it even a, a step further in, uh, in the following, and I will tell you what it means to think in a theory-independent way. The operational approach means that to, the, to every element of the theory, there is a direct counterpart in terms of laboratory procedures. And finally, the first principles, okay, <laughs> it's what it is. Um, so it's, uh, we, we try to identify the, the principles that are uh, specific to our theories and test their internal consistency, which, okay. <laughs> I don't know why it's Maybe I should just use. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think I will just use the, the arrows. Okay. So the some some of the tools that we are going to use uh, throughout these uh, two hours are Nogo theorems, communication protocols, thought experiments. So these are the typical things that we will encounter. And this is the plan. 
So these are the three points that I have tried to identify. And as examples of the first one, I will talk about generalized probabilistic theories and process matrices and indefinite causality. Then, in terms of thought experiments, I will tell you a bit, uh, very briefly, about quantum clocks and interferometers. And finally, I will uh, talk about quantum reference frames. So that's the plan. And so let's get started. So for this first part, um, these are the two main references that I'm going to use. So, and I really said, so I'm, again, I will just sketch all the arguments, but these two references are really good if you want to go a bit uh, more deep, uh, deeply into the details of uh, generalized probabilistic theories in particular. And um, so one thing that I would like to stress here is that I'm going to give you these two examples, generalized probabilistic theories and W matrices, and in particular generalized probabilistic theories is probably what exemplifies the theory independent thinking uh, the most. But uh, the type of thinking is actually common to many other um, results. Okay, so let, let me start with a quote, uh, with, which is, I will read it. First, some good news. Quantum field theory is based on the same quantum mechanics that was invented by Schrodinger, Heisenberg, Pauli, Born, and others in 1925-26, and has been used ever since in atomic, molecular, nuclear, and condensed matter physics. So uh, in this quote, the, what, what I like of this quote is that um, it emphasizes that there is some common structure in quantum theory that uh, is independent of whether you're considering finite dimensional system, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, quantum field theory. And so that there, there is a structure that is more general than that. And do you have an idea who said that? I think I, I, spoiled, I, I spoiled it before. So you probably know it's Steven Weinberg. It, this is chapter two of quantum field theory of the book. And these three elements are what uh, are the common structure that he identifies at the beginning uh, of, his, of his book. And actually all the canonical approach to quantum field theory comes much later in the book, like chapter seven, I think. So I wanted to have this here because uh, it, it emphasizes a point that I want to bring to the extreme now, which is that the fact that there is some underlying structure in the theory that characterizes the theory regardless of the specific details that compose the theory. And in particular, for quantum theory, we, we talk about quantum theory, but actually we talk about quantum theory in different ways according to the specific description that we're giving of quantum theory. So here I have a list, uh, again, it's not exhaustive, it's just some examples of different ways in which we call something quantum. So for instance, we refer to, we say that something is quantum if it shows superpositional entanglement. We say that something is quantum in, in terms of the path integral formulation or in terms of the Heisenberg picture. And then uh, in quantum field theory, we say that something is quantum if there is emission of quantized radiation and so on. And these, are, these definitions do not all coincide. But again, we said that there is an underlying common structure. So how can we approach this question? And the way that the Quantum Foundation's community has been uh, addressing this question is by taking an operational approach. What does it mean that the fundamental structure of a theory is given by the probabilities, which is we trust what the detector, like the click of a detector. We trust if the detector is up, tells us up or down, plus or minus. But we try to remove as much as possible the ontological structure from the theory. And, and so the, the, now I'm entering into a more, like the, the operational approach and in particular into the generalized probabilistic theories framework. 
in, we define, so we can start defining a theory by defining uh, laboratory procedures. And in particular, we have three laboratory procedures. The first one is preparation. So preparation means I have a device and I have some knobs on this device. I can press one of these knobs and then I prepare an in S state, omega. And at this level, the state is just an element of a vector space. It's nothing else. And we know that from this state, we will be able to compute probabilities. Then we have transformation. Because when we send out the state from our device, uh, we, will, we can act upon it with some measure, sorry, with some, you know, like a, there can be a mirror, there can be a waveguide, there can be like all sorts of uh, devices that we have in our laboratory. And, um, and, this, and, and this transforms the state, it changes the state. And then we have measurements, which, uh, through which we can obtain a classical outcome. And in the end, our goal is to write the probability of obtaining a certain outcome A, given the preparation, the transformation, and the measurement. So there are two important numbers in, uh, in this picture which is k, the number of degrees of freedom, which is the minimum number of measurements needed to determine the state, and the n, the dimension, which is the maximum number of states that we can perf perfectly distinguish. So, to give you an example, let us consider a bit, which is a classical two-level system. In this case, we have uh, n is equal to two, because, so you can, you can see that basically this would be the state of status spaces. You can throw a coin, you have either head or tail, and head or tail are the two extremes of this line. And then in the middle, you have all the probabilistic mixture of having head, of head or tail. So you, and head or tail, of course, can be perfectly distinguished. So n is equal to two, and then, k is equal to 2, but uh, you have to be careful because then we want the state to be normalized, so this removes one degree of freedom. So in the end, it's 1, and actually we can distinguish whether it's head or tail with just one measurement. And if we have a qubit instead, you, this is the block sphere. So again, um, n is equal to 2 because the perfectly distinguishable states are the ones that are on the op two opposite sides of the block sphere. And k is equal to 4 minus 1 with the normalization, which are the three Pauli operators, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. And then there is a very important notion uh, in uh, generalized probabilistic theories, which is the equivalence. So given that we are basically removing all the, uh, so we have a black box approach. So we, we know the probabilities, but we are not guaranteed that uh, the probabilities are given by just one element of the theory. There can be some elements that lead, exact, basically that do not allow us to distinguish which one of the two representations of a state, for instance, we can have. And so we have to remove this redundancy. I, I will give you an example which will clarify what we mean. So the first preparation, so let, let's imagine uh, preparation one. This is an example that I took from Marcus Mueller's notes. So this, uh, in, we have first preparation and imagine we have a coin and we throw this coin, if we get goose, then we prepare a state up in terms of density matrix, up, up, up cat, up bra. And if we prepare, if we get the boat, instead we get, we prepare down. And then see, this is a throw of a coin, so it's a classical probability, and you can write down the state, which is a mixed state, 
up, up, down, down. But then we can consider a, a different procedure, uh, sorry, a different preparation procedure, which is I prepare an entangled state of one, two, and then I discard state two. And in the end, I find again the same state. I mean, quantum theory here. So, these two, I have no way to distinguish the end result that I got. It's the same state. So in GPTs, they're said to be equivalent. Okay. And another important property for the set of states is convexity. So that's a little bit less intuitive to explain, but um, you can think of it as how do I, as a, as a way of preparing a state, I have a, a set of classical numbers, i. I extract a number i, and I associate a state omega i to this i. Then I discard the number i. And this preparation procedure will give me a state omega that is inside my set. But since, because of the way I have ex extracted these numbers, I expect the probability of obtaining a certain outcome when I prepare omega to be linear in all the extractions that were independent. And so I expect this structure for the probability. And this means that since everything is linear, that I can write the state omega in that way. And, and that's what we mean when we say convexity. Okay, so that's the most technical slide that I have. So this specific presentation, I took it from our paper, but uh, it's, a, it's, standard, uh, it's a standard GPT presentation. So in, in this way of presenting it, and it will be clear why I want to uh, explain it in this way, uh, in a couple of slides, we we can define the generalized probabilistic theories in terms of kinematics, dynamics, and composition. So we said that for the kinematics, we have a convex state space that is this omega. And then the measurements are uh, an element of the dual vector space that leads to a probability assignment that which, when we sum over all possible outcomes, gives us probability one. And in this uh, picture, pure states are the extremal states of the set, and mixed states are convex combinations of, of pure states. Then we have transformations, and transformations are linear in uh, generalized probabilistic theories. And then we have composition, and composition actually uh, came up even earlier uh, in the quantum gravity lecture um, and uh, for, for gra related to gravity. And this is um, pretty much related to what was said before. So composition in, uh, uh, in quantum information is the way of talking about locality because we address subsystems. We can divide uh, a system into different subsystems thanks to composition. And the thing is that when you talk at, at such a general level of, uh, of, your, of your theory, then you cannot just compose, you cannot just um, automatically compose two systems with a standard tensor product. But every time you compose two systems, then you have to uh, rederive rules to embed these states in a bigger, in a bigger space. Um, you have to rederive the rules for measurements. You have to rederive, rederive also the rules to obtain the reduced states. You cannot take this for granted. And for instance, let us consider two spaces, VA and VB, that we want to compose. Then we're going to have this star product that, we, that will compose them into a joint space, VC. And you have to think of these spaces as the space of density matrix not the space of vector states. And 
So basically, the, the standard tensor product gives us the independent preparations of the state. And this is usually contained in this more general structure that is this VC, that is the, the final tensor product. And it can have different properties. And in particular, if these two coincide, which is the case for both classical and quantum theory, then we say that a property that is called tomographic locality holds. And this basically, intuitively, this means that I can have all the information I need about, so the, the, basically the quantum state is fully characterized by local measurements on the subsystems. Okay, and after this, we can finally say <laughs> what we mean when we say that something is quantum. And just bear with me for one more minute, because I think it's probably easier to first understand what is classical. So if we have a classical theory which has n outcomes, then the state space, omega a, is composed by all vectors which have uh, as in, in their entries some p numbers p1 up to pn, uh, where each pi is uh, um, greater or e equal to zero, and the PIs sum up to one. And the state of effects, uh, the space of effects is the uh, dual space to omega A, such that, so it's basically made by the functionals that when they take any of the states omega, uh, in the state space, this, give, this returns a number between zero and one, and, and this c c characterizes the state of the, the measurements, basically. And from this definition, you can have a characterization of the measurements. So finally, quantum theory, it's very similar. It's the, the state space is the set of matrix of emission Hermitian matrices, uh, such that the each, each matrix is positive and the trace of the matrix is one. So it's what we're used to thinking about when we write the quantum state. And again, the, sta the space of effects is a set of functionals that whenever you, uh, you apply them to a state, gives a number between zero and one, and, uh, yeah, and that's it. <laughs> Okay, so again, I want to stress that the set of measurements can be fully characterized from this definition. So you can find an explicit form of what the measurements are. And in quantum theory, for instance, this can be written as completely positive maps. What do we mean by completely positive maps? It's a map that maps a positive operator, like rho, into a positive operator. And whenever I add auxiliary Hilbert spaces, this also maps the positive operator to a positive operator. And all, in addition, so I is the classical outcome, and when I sum over, the, over all possible outcomes, it also preserves the trace. Okay. Now, I just want to you to remember this in a couple of slides, because this will be useful in a couple of slides. And now I want to give you a maybe unconventional example of why I think this type of reasoning is useful. So this is a paper from Bogdan Milnik in 1980. And so this was still before what, we, what now we would call the, like the standard approach to generalized probabilistic theories, but it had it, it, its ancestor. And he studied nonlinear quantum mechanics in this fashion. So let's take an equation. So, so this is an equation for qubits, but it, uh, well, two level systems, but uh, it has the same structure as the Schrodinger Newton equation. And as the name says, we call this nonlinear quantum mechanics. And let's consider two arbitrary pure states. 
no assumptions on these two pure states. Now, what Milnik showed is that you see the, so you cannot distinguish the colors very well, but there is a black and a green. The black is just the line, and the greens are the triangles. So now look at the black line. This is the evolution of a quantum state under a linear dynamical law. So just standard quantum theory. You for if you imagine the block sphere, then a quantum system evolves on a line on the, on the block sphere. But when you modify the dynamical law and you make it non-linear, then the system does not need to follow a line. It has a higher degree of mobility. So it can evolve into different directions on the state of spaces. Sorry? It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, usual Laplacian. So, okay, so, sorry, so okay. So, size of function of x, is that a, is that yeah, just a two-state? Yeah, okay, so, sorry, uh, I actually, I think I probably copied the, the wrong equation. So, that's a, there is a qubit version of that equation which has like a sigma x instead of the, of the Laplacian. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, okay, so it can evolve in the, into different, into different directions. So basically, what happens is that if you picture that, then you can take these two arbitrary states and bring them totally apart in two opposite points of the block sphere. So for instance, you can take psi to the North Pole and phi to the South Pole by devising a procedure. So basically, these are two states that are perfectly distinguishable. What does this mean? That no, so Again, now you would have to redefine the kinematics of your theory because of, because of this. And, but the important point is that the theory acquires classical features because I can devise a procedure that allows me one shot to perfectly distinguish two arbitrary states. So the theory is not that quantum after all. <laughs> and now the, the thing is that in this case, so this is fine as long as we have one system. But as soon as we have two, we do not know how to compose them anymore. So at the moment, as far as I know, uh, there is no way of writing down. Um, so we do not know how to, what the tensor product of two systems would behave like that is. So this is an open question. Okay. so. That's all I wanted to tell you about generalized probabilistic theories. Now, uh, I will go to another example of application of this uh, theory-independent reasoning that are W matrices or process matrices. You will find them in the literature with both names. And, um, and they, so again, this, they, they are not formulated in the language of generalized probabilistic theories, but the flavor the, is the same. So process matrices, uh, we usually hear the name process matrices related to indefinite causality. So they are a formalism thanks to which we can define, we call them processes without a definite causal order. What does it mean in this language to have an indefinite causal order? We will see that in one slide in more technically, but Roughly, the, the meaning is that uh, we describe causality operationally in terms of the possibility of signaling. So if A cannot signal to B, A cannot be in the causal path of B. If B cannot signal to A, then uh, B cannot be in the causal path of A. And the way we do that, it's very quantum information-like. We have two parties. Alice and Bob, each of them have their local laboratory. And in their local laboratory, we assume that quantum theory holds. So that's a starting assumption. And remember what I told you before, we have a set of measurements. In quantum theory, we can characterize this set of measurements. 
who has completely positive mass. So we take that set of measurements here and we just impose it on A and on B. And A and B, each of them has an input Hilbert space and an output Hilbert space. Now, we play the opposite game the, the, to the one that we played in the case of generalized probabilistic theories. Remember there, we fix the set of states and we derive the measurements. Here, we fix the measurements and we derive the set of states. So, we take these measurements to be the quantum measurements, and then we ask, what is the most general object that I can write in that form, and we could discuss whether this form is the most appropriate one, but that's another choice. Um, so, this W object that gives me meaningful probabilities. So, basically, that whenever I apply this W to Mi and Mj, it gives me a number that is uh, uh, greater or equal to zero, uh, and that when I sum over all outcomes, it gives me one. That's the requirement. And we find that if we, if we do that, then we find that, w, we find that this object can be fully characterized, and in particular, we find that W is a positive operator, we find that it has some normalization, which is that one that I wrote. And then we find that it cannot live on the full Hilbert space, which is the uh, tensor product Hilbert space of A input, A output, B input, B output. But it, has, it lives in a subspace, which is defined by a projector. So it has to be projected on a subspace of the full Hilbert space. This projector has a form that is not very nice to write, but at this level, it's really not important what the form of the projector is, as long as you know that there is a constraint that, it, that W has to obey. So these are the, um, these are the, is what characterizes W. And then we said, well, W matrices specify the signaling properties between the local laboratories. How? In terms of probabilities, we can characterize signaling. So I can write the probability of obtaining outcome i in A, outcome j in B, given that I prepared x in A and y in B. And then if I sum over all possible outcomes of B, and then basically B cannot signal to A if the remaining probability of A is independent of the choice of B of the input of B. So basically, if I trace over the outcome of, if I sum over the outcome of B, then the re remaining probability for A does, cannot depend on anything that B did if B is not in the past of A. And the same goes for if we do the opposite. So just with I, we just swap I and J and X and Y. So, if we, and remember the W's, we define them as probabilities. So the, the trace of the local operations and the W's uh, are, uh, is a probability that is well defined. So it has this structure. And then if we write the, if, if we write the, 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 pro, the set of probabilities for a W, then we find scenarios in which we cannot order. So nothing of these holds. So basically, we, we cannot explain as a signaling probability and also not as a, a non-signaling probability like a Bell scenario. And notice that this is automatically rid uh, uh, of logical paradoxes. So paradoxes of the type of the grandfather paradox, when I go back in time, kill my grandfather. This is clearly a logical paradox, but these do not enter the W's in any way. So they are automatically excluded in the moment when you normalize probabilities. So normalizing the probabilities is enough to automatically get rid of all logical paradoxes. And so basically, this is a way of talking about a signaling structure, about causal order in an operational way, which does not need to refer to space-time. 
And I think that this is probably the nicest uh, point to emphasize in this context for, w, for process matrices. Now, what do we mean by indefinite causality? So there are different degrees of indefiniteness that you can consider. The lowest one is no indefinite causality. So when the processes are causally ordered, either A is before B, B is before A, or they have no relation with each other. And this is our usual description in quantum theory. Then we have something that we call causally separable. That we, so we have to use, uh, get used to the language, but it's actually pretty intuitive. It's, it's like when you have a coin, you throw a coin, if you get head, then either A signals to B or they don't signal. And if you get tail, then either B signals to A or they don't signal. So it's a probabilistic mixture of causally ordered processes to introduce some terminology. And then, so you can think of that as mixed states, for instance, and then imagine what, what, what is the difference between a mixed state and an entangled state, that an entangled state cannot be written as a probabilistic mixture of pure states. And the same is for causally non-separable ones. So if I cannot write uh, a process matrix as a probabilistic mixture of uh, causally ordered processes, then I have a causally non-separable uh, process matrix. Where, and for, and an example for those of you who know it is the quantum switch. The quantum switch is uh, causally non-separable. And uh, because it is a quantum superposition of causal orders. So you have a quantum superposition of something that where A happens before B and superposed with a case in which B happens before A. This, still, this is not the highest degree of indefinite causality that we can reach. There is one more, which the switch, the quantum switch does not satisfy the quantum switch uh, still uh, does not violate any causal inequality. But there are some processes that violate the so-called causal inequalities, which are the equivalent for um, process matrices to Bell inequalities, to what Bell inequalities are for quantum theory. And these processes that violate the causal inequality are strange processes. <laughs> so we do not know how to interpret them physically. We don't even know whether they are physical or not. This is an example. So this is, sometimes we call it the original W, sometimes the OCBW, because it was the, it, it's in the first paper by Ognian, Oreshkov, Fabio Costa, and Czesław Bruckner. Uh, they, they wrote it in that paper precisely because this violated the causal inequality. And so it, it was an interesting case that has been studied a lot because it has some very strange properties. And that is the form. So Z and X are just the Pauli sigma Z and sigma X. And they're written in that way because otherwise they have too many indices. And then you, let's, okay, so let's look at, at this W. Now, Forget that term. The remaining one, you see, you ha we have a term that goes from A output to B input. So this is a channel from A to B. Then forget about the other term. And then you see we have a term on A input and B input. So that's a shared state. And then we additionally have a term on B output so it can also have a channel from B to A. We call this a channel with memory. When we put them together, we don't know. <laughs> we just don't know what it physically corresponds to. And so for this W in particular, there has been a lot of studies and in the, there are independent arguments that make us think that this is not physical. And arguments of various types, but in general, for Ws like this one that violate a causal inequality, 
we do not know whether they can be realized or not. Okay, so this is the, the, what I wanted to tell you on this first part. So if you have questions, please ask them now. I'll just wrap up. And I will, so the point that I would like to stress is that this approach, um, I do not think that it is interesting because we want to find theories that are beyond quantum theory and we think that this is the correct description. I think that there are other, um, other elements of this approach that make it interesting, which are, for instance, the fact that you can test the internal consistency in a systematic way, so it's particularly uh, suited to test the internal consistency of a theory. You can also describe hybrid models with this type of approach, so mod like interactions between classical and quantum or even like something more general, without, uh, with the same formalism. So, and you can test that everything is working well, that probabilities are probabilities, and that the measurements are a closed test, and so on. And then it, it allows you also to systematically characterize physical properties, like we have done for the Ws, for instance, for the process matrices. And finally, which is maybe the one that is, uh, is the hardest to, uh, to get familiar with, but maybe even the most powerful, is the robustness of the result, because you are deriving a result without really assuming any structure of your physical theory. So whatever your physical theory is, even if you have to modify it, even perturbatively in, in the future, then this result is going to hold. And I think that this is probably the, the most interesting aspect of that. Okay. Questions? Okay. No, uh, yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, I have a question from Inya. Um, <clears throat> on the first slides, when I, I think that's originally from Lucien Hardy, this distinction between what is a dimension and what is the degree of freedom. And you were saying in the example of the qubit, so the Hilbert space is, is C2, so the dimension is 2. You are saying the degrees of freedom, according to this definition, is 4. But I, um, I think this is using the term of degree of freedom in a sense which is not the familiar one in physics, no. Because if for the qubit, I think all physicists would say the, that the number of degrees of freedom of the qubit is uh, 2 rather than 4. Oh, it's because it's a real number. You need three real numbers to characterize a qubit. So three measurements. I, I don't Sig get it. You so you, uh, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, right? Yeah. Because if I write the density matrix ah. of, of a qubit, then uh, I have something on the diagonal that is uh, real, and then something off diagonal where I have basically just one number that is different. But uh, you said it was uh, it's four, not three. You know, that's four because I, we didn't impose normalization. So normalization oh. removes one degree of freedom. Ah, right, yeah. okay. And, and why is that um, familiar use of, of the word of, of degrees of freedom? No. Sorry? Well, I mean, I, I'm just a bit troubled by the, the way we use the term of degrees of freedom. I, I think in physics, in different areas, we name different things a degree of freedom, like there's no universal uh, definition of it. But um, I don't really understand why you want to call this a degree of freedom. Yeah, so that, that's a standard uh, terminology for that. Uh, I, I have not thought enough whether this is uh, fully compatible with other definitions, like with the usual definition of degrees of freedom. Uh, and uh, that's what Lucien uses in uh, his uh, first paper on generalized probabilistic theory. Um, yeah, so I don't have a better answer than that. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, in your last example, uh, uh, that was very interesting. Yeah, uh, so can you state what is the causal inequality that is violated? 
sorry, can I? Uh, yeah, you spoke about causal inequalities yeah. that are violated yeah. in some cases, and yeah. you gave us an example. Can you state what is the causal inequality violated in that example? If, if I can explain that. Mm -hmm. So that one, uh, so there are various causal inequalities that you can formulate. So the simplest one is uh, you have two parties, okay? And then I can uh, give an, uh, an input to the two parties. So I can secretly say, one of you, like you have this input that is either 0 or 1, and the other one of you, you have this input that is either 0 or 1. And you do not know what I said to the other person. And then I ask you uh, to play a game to guess what I said to the other person. And you can only communicate once. So if you communicate, uh, so basically the best strategy that you can, and you have to collaborate to win this game. So the best strategy that you can use in a definite causal order to win the game is that one of you, you decide who, tells what I told you as an input to the other person. And then the person who receives the information knows for sure that this is uh, the, like what the input is, and the other one who communicated the information can only guess. And if, I, if there are only two outputs, then you have probability one half to guess the correct outcome. So basically, with a, a definite causal order, you can win the game at most with probability one half if you play the best strategy. And you have no disturbance, no delay in the line, no nothing. Then, with, if, you, if, you, if you have W matrices instead, you can find a W matrix that wins at this game with higher probability than one half. So that can do better than what you can do in a definite causal order, basically. So that's the, the flavor of the causal inequality. Thank you. Um, a question. So you said that there was no uh, notion of space-time in the, but there is um, a preferred input and output. And how do you justify that? That seems to be a notion of uh, symmetric. True. So, uh, yes. True. There is uh, an input and there is an output. In so, so, and that's the assumption that inside the local laboratories you can you have quantum mechanics as it is usually. So that, that's an assumption of the framework that we can discuss. We can go beyond that. But that's what they assumed when they derived the framework. So that's the reason why. Sorry. Uh, thank you for the talk. So you mentioned that even with there's indefinite causal structure. There are no logical paradoxes because of the normalization. But I didn't understand why. Could you explain that again? Yeah, so basically, you could have, a, OK, let's just restrict to one party. Because it's, it's simpler to, to understand that. And when you have two parties, it's just a bit more complicated, but it's the same. So now imagine I have input and output. Then my, I chose as, a, as an input one. Uh, sorry, z, let's say 0. Then I have, and I know that my channel is the identity channel to go back. So nothing happens between my input and my output, OK? Then if I apply a flip operation inside my local laboratory, then from 0, I send it, I send it to 1. And then I have an identity channel that brings it back to 0. Sorry, that brings it back to the input. So from 1, I have again and the input 1. So remember, this is only always one shot. So you, it's like you have the local laboratories that are opened once, and then you close them again. And so it's always the same uh, structure. So if I had a channel that goes back from A output to A input, then I would have a logical paradox, because I would have 0 equal to 1. And the, the normalization on probabilities automatically rules this out. So you cannot have that. And that's the same, that it, it goes exactly in the same way for the two-party scenario. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, Brian Minia, for the great talk. I just have one uh, naive question, I guess. So, a few months ago, I think uh, Vilasini and uh, Renato Renner came out with another paper that shows that you can find grain uh, some of these indefinite causal structure into something that is completely cyclic in terms of relativistic causality. So, do you think uh, any of these things will change, or how much this kind of fine graining arguments will work? So, I haven't had time to read the state on my reading list yet. Yes, it's 60 <laughs> pages. So. I haven't had, I haven't read the the uh, that paper, but actually, it's a, it's a, it's a pity that Ognan is not here, uh, because he has uh, he has a paper where he relates this. Uh, a diagrammatic approach to causality with W matrices by imposing some cyclicity condition, basically. So maybe he will have more to comment on that. Okay. So let's go to the second part quantum clocks and interferometers. So the, the first thing that we want to define if we're going to talk about quantum clocks is a clock. And uh, this is the simplest model of a clock, which is a two-level system. So now we're back to quantum theory, just to, <laughs> just to make, make it clear. So we have a two-level quantum system. And if we want this two-level quantum system to behave as a clock, then we have to initialize it in a state that is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, otherwise nothing changes, to the, nothing happens to the clock. So if this is on the right hand side is the Hamiltonian, then for instance, we can initialize our clock in the E0 plus E1 state. And then when we apply time evolution, we find that the clock evolves with a relative phase that is uh, that depends on the relative on, on the energy gap basically between the excited and the ground state. Now, the precision of the clock is given by how well I can distinguish a state at time t from the state at time zero. So basically, the best that I can I can achieve is to have a minus instead of a plus in front of E1. When does that happen? It happens at the orthogonalization time, which is the time it takes the clock to go from the initial state to the orthogonal state to the initial state, which, is, which has that expression. So basically, that, re that relative phase has to be pi. And the important thing here that I would like you to notice is that this is inversely pro proportional to the energy gap. So basically, the more precise I want the clock to be, the more I, ca I have to increase the energy gap. But what happens if I put a lot of energy into the gap of this clock? I want a very precise clock. This happens. That E equal to mc squared. So the internal energy also contributes to the total mass of a clock. So you can think of this as I have, uh, so now we're, this is a classical argument, but uh, so we have a dispersion relation for a particle, then this is equal to the rest energy. And the rest energy is the mass at rest, but it's also, also the internal energy is part of the rest energy. And uh, so basically, it's the total energy of the internal and internal degrees of external and internal degrees of freedom. So, and the H in the case of our clock is a quantum operator. So basically, we have a mass that becomes a quantum operator. So basically, we are in a situation in which we have a quantum superposition of masses. And this created some debate long time ago and this is called the so this, it's called the Bergman super selection rule that I'm going to explain now so imagine you start from a state psi zero any arbitrary state and then I'm going what I'm going to do now is a cyclic transformation to go back to the initial state so from psi zero I apply translation by a 
then I apply a Galilean boost by V, then I translate back by minus A, and then I boost back by minus V. So this is a cyclic transformation. And so now we know that these states all, so, sorry, that these unitary operators all have a representation. So if I represent them, and if I multiply all four of them, one by the other, then I obtain a global phase in front of psi zero that has that form, where M is the mass of, of our particle, the particle that we boosted. So clearly, if, if we have just one particle with a fixed mass, this is not a problem, this is just a global phase, it goes away. But if we have a superposition of masses, then this phase becomes a relative phase. And then Bargman said, well, we cannot have, have that just for a cyclic transformation, we have a relative phase appearing. So he imposed a mass super selection rule. So now we know, like from the point of view of Galilean symmetries, that actually the mass is a generator of, of the symmetry, it's a Casimir. But there is a physical interpretation of that that was given by Daniel Greenberger. And he recognized that actually that phase is a remnant of a special relativistic proper time. So basically, you can rewrite that phase in terms of the different proper time that has elapsed. And and so basically, he said, well, this is not the, a bug of a theory, it's just a feature, and it's actually a relativistic effect that, that is propagating to, to this regime. And this is the same if you have gravity, by the way. So let's take this superposition of masses, and let's, let's use it in the context when uh, we put a clock in the gravitational field because in the end, the superposition of masses is because we wanted to have a clock. So, and what we're going to do is to put it in an interferometric setup, and our goal is to test the consistency of two principles. One is gravitational time dilation, and the other one is the principle of linear superposition. We want to use them both and see what happens in a concrete scenario. And so we have the Earth and we have an interferometer. Of course, this is a very theorist interferometer and um, where the clock can either take the lower path, gamma one, or the upper path, gamma two. Now, you, we, we you like to think of this slogan that is uh, like useful to remember. Uh, lower is lower, this means that the clock is slower if it's lower in the gravitational field, and it's faster if it's higher in the gravitational field. So basically the clock on gamma two ticks more quickly than the clock on gamma one. We initialize the, our clock, then we, uh, after the first beam splitter, the clock degree of free freedom becomes entangled with the path degree of freedom, and this is the state before the last beam splitter that accumulates a relative phase, uh, which is due to the, well, to the different trajectories that the clock took, to the, to basically to the different Hamiltonians applied to that state, to different propagation. And the important thing is that when we look at the visibility of the interferometer at the end of the experiment, we find that there is a reduction of visibility that is due to the state of the clock. So if we didn't have the clock, we could have a relative phase, but we would have no reduction of visibility because the reduction of visibility is exclusively on the state of the clock. And the reduction of visibility is related to interference. And then we also have that the, uh, I mean, so visibility and distinguishability have to be one. So
Okay, now, now you can hear me. Okay. Okay, so basically, if visibility changes in that way, then we also have distinguishability that has to decrease. Okay, uh, so basically, uh, the, the take home message of this paper is that the clock carries which way information uh, in the proper time. So you have a trade off between the which way information that is due to the fact that the clock accumulates information about the path that it has taken in the interferometer in its proper time and the, the visibility, the interference fringes. And now we can keep playing this game by adding another clock. So if we have, let's now, let us now take two clocks that are gravitationally interacting with each other. Now here we got rid of all the external degrees of freedom. We're just considering the, the degrees of freedom of the clock. But basically that the, the, the term that is both on A, A and B is the gravitational interaction where H would play the role of H divided by C squared would play the role of a mass. You can derive that in a more formal way, but basically this is the, you would get the same thing. And then we can put these two clocks one next to the other. So now they are, I drew them in this way because, I, I, because of illustration, but these two clocks are exactly the same. They, they are equal, identical clocks. So now, Let's focus on the clock on the right, and let's uh, and this clock on the right is initialized in that blue state, is zero plus e one, but we know that according to the energy, to the state in which the clock on the left is, the clock on the right will tick differently. So if it's in e zero, it will tick according with the gravitational time dilation given by the energy E0, if it's in E1, it will tick with the gravitational time dilation due to E1. So, we also know that since the one on the left is a, is a clock itself, then it will have its own orthogonalization time, and since we want the clocks to be precise, we want to make that as big as we can. But basically, the more, so the, the larger we make that energy gap, the more we are going to screw the, the, the way the other clock ticks, because there will be more difference between the time dilation when it's in E0 and the time dilation when it's in E1. And we can quantify that with that delta T here. So you see, one is inversely proportional to the energy gap, the other one is directly proportional to the energy gap. And now, if we multiply these two quantities, we find the quantity that is independent of the energy gap, which is basically an uncertainty principle for the clock, for, for how well you can measure time when you have two nearby clocks. So there is a limit in the measurability of time at two nearby clocks when they gravitationally interact with each other. Okay. That's what I said. So, if you have questions, that's another good moment to ask. Yes. So um, this morning we saw that Hall was talking about that when you have gravitational-like interaction, it's not trivial to factorize the Hilbert space, right? Um, but here you're somehow assuming that you have a tensor product between clock A and B, and still they're interacting gravitationally. So, so a tensor product between? Between the clocks, like the Hilbert space, the global Hilbert space is a tensor product of the Hilbert space of the clock A. I'm just clock assuming B. that I can measure one clock independently of the other. When, when you wrote your Hamiltonian, you have H A plus H B, and then well, H okay, that's just that's just what the Hamiltonian that you get when you take the usual uh, 
d squared divided by 2, 2m plus v of x, where v of x is the interaction between the two clocks, and you make the mass energy equivalent, basically. So you didn't say that your global Hilbert space is a factorization of I didn't say clocks? that, no. So you don't see any tension with these, with the fact no. that you couldn't be able to factorize Hilbert space when you have gravity? No, I do not say that. No, I do not, I do not think that this, this is just, basically it has the same status as the Newtonian uh, interaction in non-relativistic physics. If you have two, two in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, two particles that are interacting via the Newtonian potential, then, and, you, and you're fine with saying that I can take an, an initial state and evolving it, then I think this is the same. So let me just clarify, is, is that, so in this case, two clocks are not gravitationally interacting with each other, right? They are actually on the background of a gravitational field. No, in this case, in the last case that I showed you, they are gravitationally interacting with each other. Actually, it's a very small effect, very, very tiny. So they, they gravitate to each other? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we can move on to the last topic. Uh, yeah, still have, I still have time, yeah. Which are quantum reference frames. Okay, so this is uh, uh, a topic that has been around since 1967. So there were the first two papers on, uh, this, uh, on this topic in the same year. One by De Witt, for, and that gave origin to the quantum gravity approach to, uh, the, to quantum reference systems, usually they're called. And the other one by Aharonov and Susskind, which started the approach to in quantum information. And then there have been many results also in the 90s and in the, two, year, uh, in the 2000s on quantum reference frames, also in the, well, both quantum gravity and quantum information community. And actually, some people who have worked on that are, are or will be here <laughs> in the next few days. Uh, so you can also ask them. Uh, but uh, my goal today is to tell you about uh, a specific approach to quantum reference frames. And uh, which is the one I'm mostly familiar with. And um, before I, so, and also this has quite a lot of results. So there are many papers that uh, fall into this, uh, this approach now, but um, I won't have, due to time constraints, I won't be able to review them all. So I will just give you a very broad introduction to the topic. But again, in, uh, the, in this conference, there are many people who worked on that. And I have some, a, a list of references at the last slide, so you can see the names and go and ask these people what they think. And, but before I go into that, let, me let us just set the stage for this and let us define, let us share some language what we mean by reference frame usually in physics. So usually we think of reference frames as abstract entities that are used to fix the point of view from which observations are carried out. So for instance, if we have the, the Canadian goose and a set of axes, we choose the origin, and then inter, as, um, depending on where we fix this origin, we can describe uh, the physical system P in terms of these coordinates. And then we know that reference frames are very useful, but in the end, physics is the same regardless of the choice of the reference frame. And now, let us consider quantum theory, and actually non-relativistic quantum, Galilean quantum mechanics. A possible change of a reference frame can be a translation or a boost, 
And we have a unitary representation of the translations and the boost that has that form. But what I would like you to focus your attention on for now is that the relation between the initial reference frame and the final reference frame is a parameter. So it's x0 and v. And if we interpret it physically, x0 is the amount by which I translate. So it's the relative distance between my initial and the final reference frame. And v is the relative velocity between my initial and final reference frame. And then if we plug this uh, transformation inside the Schrodinger equation, we find that the Hamiltonian transforms in this way that I wrote here. And this is what it means that the laws of physics are covariant. And in particular, I have a symmetry of the dynamical law if the functional form of the Hamiltonian that I write after the transformation is the same as the functional form of the Hamiltonian before the transformation. So now, let us consider A, B, and C. So I, I will use A, B, and C a lot for, for this part. And usually, I will refer to C as the initial reference frame, A as the final reference frame. And this is a relational formalism. So it means that if I look, uh, so if I stand in C, I will not describe C, but only the relational degrees of freedom are important. And so I will only describe, I have two degrees of freedom here, where, so basically two vectors that tell me what the relative distance between B and C and A and C is. So, and well, C, if I, if I stand in C, C is out of the description. And the same, if I stand in A, then A is out of the description, and it describes the position of C from her point of view and the position of B from her point of view. So now, if we think about it a bit more concretely, you see I've already I drew a rock there, because uh, when we take the perspective of a physical system, or <laughs> when we take a, a, a certain perspective, then we are referring to usually a physical system. So if I want to measure distances from the wall to the table, I will just put a ruler here on the wall, and I will see how many meters I have before I reach the table. And physical systems are ultimately quantum. So, the question that we want to answer is, can we attach a reference frame who's, uh, to, the, to an object whose state is in a superposition and of classical states? So, and here I put um, in some basis, because we know that uh, quantum theory is independent of the basis that you choose, so we want to be able to do that regardless of the basis that we choose. So more concretely, I already told you that uh, if we are in C, we are not describing C, but we're just describing A and B. We want to go to a situation in which C has a quantum state of A and B, which can be in a quantum superposition or entangled, to a state in which A sees B and C in a quantum superposition. So we want to have a way to make sense of, the trans of taking the perspective of A, which is a very loose way of saying what we are going to do, but it gives you the idea. So let's see how we do that. So the simplest case that we can consider is the transformation to relative coordinates. So again, let's start from C and let's describe A and B, and we want to go to A that describes B and C. And you see, the transformation that we want to do is that one if you just follow the arrows. So the vector, you see that the vectors compose, if I want to describe the position of C from the point of view of A, then I just take minus the vector. And the position of B from the point of view of A is XB, uh, is QB minus QC. So it's the vector B and QC. So to do that, 
let us consider initially uh, uh, this uh, coordinate that P assigned, and imagine that we just want to translate to a reference frame that is simply displaced by alpha. In this case, we know how to do that. We can yeah, just apply the class standard translation in quantum theory, and we know that we're going to go to relative coordinates of B, X minus alpha. But if instead of that sharp position, we have a state that is of that type, then you see that we do not have any more a single position that we can put in that exponential there. So we do not, I do not know which position to pick. So what can we do? Well, the, <coughs> the solution that we found was that you can apply quantum theory in a linear superposition. So you can apply it as a translation in a linear superposition in position basis. So you just believe in the linearity of quantum theory. And, and then you basically will translate by every possible position in which A can be. But then you know that the points that correspond to the, well, to, so there are some points that are more likely, in which it's more likely to find system A, this will count more than the points when it's not, where it's not likely to find system A. And so in the end, we also want to weigh the translation by the quantum state. And if we do that, then we get that expression where the difference that you see from the standard translation is that we promoted the parameter of the transformation to an operator, and the operator lives on an additional Hilbert space that I put in, that is the Hilbert space of the quantum reference frame. And the, the quantum reference frame has a state. So now it's written in that way, but you can totally exchange A and B and, and their roles. So you, I could have chosen B as the quantum reference frame, and there's no difference. Another thing that I want to stress is that this is all within quantum theory. There's nothing beyond, beyond quantum theory here. It's just a quantum theoretical framework where we are just generalizing the standard reference frame transformation. And in addition, we, uh, we need a, another operator here that is this PAC. We call it parity swap. And the parity swap basically allows us to transform all the relative positions consistently. And in particular, it acts by, as a parity operator, so x goes to minus x, p goes to minus p, and the labels a and c are swapped. And this is because we want to achieve that transformation that I wrote uh, on top of, top left of the slide. So now, let's see, an example so that we can understand a bit better what is going on. And let us consider a situation in which from the point of view of C, A is in a well-defined position and B is in a new quantum state. Now, if we just move to A, then what we want to see is the same situation just rigidly translated. And this is what we see. So that's exactly what happens when we change the reference frame. And then, let us consider a slightly more complicated situation where we have still a product state of B and C, sorry, of A and B, but where A is in a quantum superposition of two well-defined positions. So in that case, for each amplitude in, of the state in which A can be found, we find the result that is written above. <laughs> and um, but then, we, you see, the state is in a quantum superposition, so we have to apply a translation by x1 when A is in x1, and the translation by x2 when A is in x2, in a quantum superposition. So for people who are more familiar with the quantum information language, that's a quantum control transformation on the Hilbert space of the re quantum reference frame. And if we do that, then we find A in a fixed position, and then C and B are in an entangled state. You see that there, where if C is in minus X1, B was translated by X1, 
And if T is in minus X2, B was translated by X2. So this, uh, from this equation, you can see a pretty general feature of the quantum reference train transformation, which is the fact that I can map a product state to an entangled state. And I can also do the opposite. I can map an entangled state to a product state. Is this surprising? No, because the transformation is an entangling transformation. So now, what can we do? So far, I have not included any dynamics here, but we can include dynamics. We can put a Hamiltonian, but, um, and we consider in particular extended Galilean transformations, which are transformations of that type, which were considered by Daniel Greenberger in uh, 1979. And he formalized them in uh, uh, standard quantum theory. So we will specify, we specified in particular to translations boost and the transformation to an accelerated reference frame. And you can see how, like the difference is basically the dependence on time. Special translations are uh, just a constant translation. Galilean boosts are linear in time. Accelerated reference frames are quadratic in time. And the important thing is that they can all be realized as a unitary operator. And so clearly, they, they transform as usual Hamiltonian transforms, so in this way. And now we can wonder what happens to the Hamiltonian. How does it transform? Well, it's actually a I mean, pretty straightforward calculation to show that if I start with a free particle Hamiltonian, then I get a Hamiltonian of that form, where basically I, st I always get a free particle Hamiltonian except for the accelerated reference frame, where I get a, li a linear potential. And now, in quantum reference frames, so that, that was just the standard description in uh, just quantum mechanics. In quantum reference frames, it works exactly in the same way. But the only thing that you have to take into account is that the um, Hamiltonian is not just the Hamiltonian of the system, but you also have to include the Hamiltonian of the quantum reference frame. And the way the transformation works is the following. So we have a, a we call them superposition of translations, superpositions of boosts, and superposition of accelerated reference frames. Um, and the structure is, let me just, okay. So you have, for all three of them, uh, the core of the transformation, so on the, on the left-hand side, this uh, is a, an operator that acts on the, what you would have, the, like the quantum system, what's usually the only thing that you usually have. And this is the standard transformation. So like the standard translation operator, the standard boost operator. For the accelerated case, it's a bit more tricky, but still in, uh, so basically you have to, in, you, you, have, you have to consider a, a superposition of coherent states under certain conditions to realize that. So it's like technically more tricky, but you can, still write, uh, write that. And, in, and the parameter of the transformation is controlled on an auxiliary Hilbert space, which is position velocity and acceleration of the quantum reference frame. So again, you can see that as a quantum control transformation uh, of uh, standard reference frames transformations. And the controlled uh, the control system is the quantum state of the quantum reference frame. And then if I consider an initial Hamiltonian, I will have an, if I stand in C, I have a Hamiltonian of A and B. If I stand in A, I have a Hamiltonian of B and C. And, um, and then the, the Hamiltonian transforms exactly in the same way as in the previous slide but also with the Hilbert space of the, reference, of the quantum reference frames. And 
This is what we call the extension of covariance of physical laws, which basically, I mean, basically, if you take this, uh, uh, this view, then you are implicitly saying that you're allowed to take the perspective of such a system. And then, the, uh, in addition, for the, first two for the first two transformations, the translations and the boost, you also have an extended symmetry transformation, which means that if I start from the free particle Hamiltonian for the systems A and B, then if I apply the superposition of translation or superposition of boost, then I obtain again a free particle Hamiltonian, but where all labels A are swapped to label C. So that's the meaning of the extended symmetry transformation. And from there, <laughs> you can start studying many other things. And here I've collected all the papers that fit in this page. Uh, for the, and you, you can recognize the names of many people who are here in this room. So this has been studied in, uh, in, a different, in, like in different contexts from um, in, in recent, very recent years. These are all very recent papers. And um, so I just hope that, that you get the chance of asking <laughs> many questions about that and to all the people who are here. And so that's basically what I wanted to tell you. And uh, I'm happy to take questions, but let me just say that I, so my goal with this was just to give a broad overview of topics and questions and the way we try to address these questions in, in, this, in the field. And I'm really happy that we have a mixed community here because I hope that by talking and by discussing these, uh, uh, these different aspects from one side and the other, we will just uh, enrich our understanding and manage to converge one towards the other. So I. I hope that we'll have many discussions over the next few days. And thank you. Hi. Early in your talk, you said that abstract uh, reference frames or abstract entities used to fix the point of view from which observations are carried out. Uh, and later on, you went on to talk to reference frames as physical systems, um, which is not an abstract entity at all. Um, so is that a conscious change of viewpoint? Yeah, exactly. So that's, what, that's the way we want to change the viewpoint. Okay, exactly. thank you. Yeah. Um. Uh, I have, uh, it's, it's related. I'm, so the, um, I understand that these quantum reference frames are not reference frames in the conventional sense. You don't really talk about a viewpoint of another, yes. say, of a system in a spare position, because then what, what does that mean, right? So, exactly. So what, what, what is that not a Wigner friend question? So what, what would it be then, this change of description then? Yeah, what are we talking about? Yes, so no, okay, so that's an important point because uh, like in first approximation, you say that you want to take the perspective of, of a quantum system, but this doesn't make sense. And <laughs> because there are different ways in which you can take the perspective of a quantum system. So you cannot really jump on a quantum particle. So the way I find more useful to think about this is in terms of relational observables. So you just choose a set of relational observables, and then you know that you want to map it to a different set of relational observables, and you want to map it unitarily. So it has to preserve commutation relations, basically. And, and so you will be constrained, I mean, you're the form of your transformation is constrained by the fact that you want, you want a unitary transformation to do the mapping. And, and then there are, like for instance, in, the, in all the examples that I've, shown, that I've showed before, 
then the, the Saturday chores are basically relative positions. And this means that you will have a complicated form of the, of the momenta that is not necessary, like you cannot immediately interpret as the relative velocities or relative, relative momenta. But this doesn't matter because in the end when you solve the, uh, the equations of motion, then you're going to find everything consistent. So you have relative positions and then the derivative of the relative position is the relative velocities and so on. But of course, I could have chosen a different set and everything would have worked. Just, a follow, just the, the, the access to these observable observables are in some way then tied to the observers, the different observables. I'm not talking about observers okay, here. Okay, nothing. Yeah. This okay. yeah. Okay. Um, here. Uh, maybe a quick question on the um, connection between the process matrix and the quantum reference frame. So I was wondering, in, in the process matrix formalism, the way I understand is that it, um, so you, ki you kind of encode the space-time in some sense in the signaling relations between local space-time regions where um, local quantum experiments are happening in that sense. So I was wondering, how can these two be connected? That's uh, a great question, in, yes. Yeah. Yes, thanks. So we do not have, um, precise and systematic connection between these two. But we have some examples. So we have, for instance, a time version of the quantum reference frames where you put clocks. Uh, so it's, it's basically, it, it, it's done with clocks. And in this case, we can recover the gravit, so if you're familiar with it, the gravitational switch, okay? So where, what you get is that, well, the clocks tick differently according to how, how far they are from the massive body that sources the gravitational field. And if you put this massive body in a quantum superposition, then you have a superposition of when the clock ticks. And so you can realize the quantum switch, so the superposition of causal orders in a gravitational version that's work from Magdalena, Fabio, Igor, and Zaslav. Um, in which um, basically the, according to where you place the mass, then the, you have a different causal order. So you have, uh, if you place the mass A on the right, then the system is going to go first through A, then through B, and then through C. If you place the mass on the left, then it's B, A, C. And you can do that with clocks too. And uh, here, the, the thing is that you can also take the perspective of the clock. So if from the point of view of the faraway observer, you see the clock basically receiving the state at, some, at a superposition of times, then you can show that if you take the perspective of this, quantum, of this quantum clock, in the proper time of the quantum clock, the time is the same in the two amplitudes. So basically, in terms of the proper time, the, you cannot distinguish whether your uh, particle came from the source or from the other party, so in which amplitude you are, and then um, you will see that the other, that the operation, local operation of the other part is delocalized in time. So basically you're not changing the causal order when you change the reference frame. If it's indefinite, it stays indefinite because you go to, to the clock A, say, just to make it simpler, <laughs> and then clock B is delocalized. You go to clock B and then clock A is delocalized. But the, so basically the order is, uh, if it was indefinite, it stays indefinite. But um, the time localization of the event is, uh, depends on the quantum reference frame that you pick, basically. And that's the connection that we have so far. So for example, for the, so for the, for the causal structure, like the background stru the signaling structure of the agents, let's say, will stay the same for yes. all? In terms of the W matrix causal structure, the signaling properties do not change. Mm -hmm. But the time localization of an event locally changes. Okay, thank you.
thanks for the talk. Uh, so I really enjoyed the, the, the separation into the three parts. So my question really is like, how is the quantum reference frames uh, uh, literature uh, operational? Would you say it's 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 very operational because because for example, you do not want to talk about observers, but at the same time, reference frames are <laughs> like usually it's it's about no, 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 yeah, that's a, right? that's like a good the, question. The question of what does it mean to take the perspective of a quantum particle? I mean, yeah, no, 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 that's a, that's a good question. And and do you think there's a direct there's a need to be more operational somehow? And 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 what are the ways in which yeah you can be more yeah. operational? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's a, that's a good question. So uh, it's true that for the quantum reference frames, we are not talking. Uh, in operational terms, in the standard sense, like preparation, transformation, and measurement, that's true. But it's still true that the elements of the theory have a direct correspondence in terms of laboratory operations. So we know what the elements of the theory correspond to. And the way in which I would reintroduce a more traditional sense of operationalism in this case is because, so, it's true that we cannot measure in the perspective of the quantum reference frame. I mean, the end goal for us would have been that one. It's just that it turns out to be complicated for Wigner's friend type motivations that we're going to discuss in the next few days. And, but you can always, so one thing I didn't have to talk about is that one advantage of quantum reference frames is that they allow you to identify measurements operationally when you change the reference frame. And we have done that in particular for relativistic physics. We applied to like relativ the problem of relativistic spin operator, for instance, if that makes sense. And uh, so basically, the, anyway, what I wanted to say is that you can stick to the perspective of a laboratory. Then maybe you do not know what happens in the rest frame of a particle because it has a strange quantum state. But you can go to this rest frame with a quantum reference frame transformation Define things there, for instance, internal quantities are always naturally defined in the rest frame. Go back from to the reference frame of the laboratory, measure there. It's a, it, 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 yeah, in, in oper if you want to think about it in operational terms, I would say that it's a calculational tool. Uh, Flaminia, thank you for the, the talk. It was a very good overview of everything. Uh, I did get a little, uh, not confused, but uh, it, when you introduced the quantum reference frames, you were always using Cartesian coordinates. And I understand that this is a way of, of making it explicit, the, the translation symmetries, essentially, of the theory and, and all these things. Now, uh, what would happen if you wanted to use, for instance, uh, polar uh, spherical coordinates or something like this, which would make spherical rotations not commuting and the generators would be angular momentum and things like this. Have you, have you looked into this? So we have looked a bit into this. Um, there are a couple of papers out on that. And um, so there's nothing that prevents you in principle from doing that. It's just much, much harder because you have to write an angle operator. <laughs> but and what, what is the physical meaning of, of each one of these, right? Because, I mean, it, it looks like you're assigning a physical meaning essentially to these uh, um, Cartesian coordinates and in the sense that the, of these quantum reference frames. But now, if you start going to different coordinate systems, you're going to get different perspectives as well, I imagine, right? So what, what would be the... Um, no, I wouldn't say that there is a physical meaning to choosing one set of coordinates rather than the other. It's, uh, it's just a matter of identifying your relational quantities, and once you identify them, then you're fine. So in the case of angular momentum, it would be the, it, so in the case of spherical coordinates, it would be the angular momentum, the relative angular momentum yeah. or something like this. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I also am interested in a comparison that I see between two of the sections, and it's again on these quantum reference frames, and just how you're thinking about them. So in the second section, I believe you talked about uh, this Bargman representation, where we actually don't get a, a usual representation of the group on the, the space of states, but it's a projective representation that carries interesting additional information. Um, there's a beautiful generalization of that that's not so well known. 
to actually accelerated uh, reference frames, mm -hmm. non-relativistic non accelerated reference frames, where um, you actually have to do more than the Bargman representation. You have to do what's called a loop. But at any rate, it, it, it shows that you, even in this non-inertial frame, uh, a non-relativistic non-inertial frame, you can get a symmetry representation on your space of states of the, the change to that frame. And that seems to me to be a different perspective than you're taking when you're taking the quantum reference frame picture. And I want to understand how you think of the necessity of that other perspective of making your reference frame quantum. But you're thinking about like closing the group structure? Yeah. About so, that. Yes. Yeah. So this closes the group. <laughs> so uh, we have a paper on that. And you can take the different elements of the transformation. So, okay, it's just a little bit more uh, tricky because you have a tensor product, product of the two Hilbert spaces. So you have the XA tensor PB, then PA tensor XB, then PA tensor PB, and so on, different combinations. And then you want, and also the Hamiltonian. And then you can uh, calculate all the commutation relation, basically you, you close the algebra, you can really close the algebra, and then you can show that this forms a group, for instance. And you do it without any projective representation or anything? Uh, no, actually, it, it's, a, it's a similar, so you need to add additional elements, like you did with adding the, the mass Casimir. So you, in, also in this case, the Galilei group is not enough. You need maybe a couple of more generators for that. Thank you. Hi. Um, um, thanks, Flaminia. The, in, in the um, quantum gravity literature, um, there have been a, a related discussion. Um, in general relativity, you, you have to uh, write observables that are coordinate independent, so you have to solve some, something in terms of something else. So you have to, a choice of, of what you use as your dependent and independent variables, like A, B, and C here. And in particular, um, so, so there was a notion of quantum references introduced there. But in particular, um, this has given rise to a lot of discussion, which is still going on, um, regarding the time variable. Because uh, um, from, for instance, in cosmology, uh, which is particularly simple, because it's finite dimensional systems, um, you don't you have a, a relational dynamics, you, you don't have a, a, a natural clock. Um, so you can choose one of your variables and treat it as a clock. Uh, in cosmology, you can couple a scalar field and use it as a clock or, 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 or use a volume of, uh, choose it as a clock. And if you change, so, the, so the, the, the debate is what happens if you change from one to the other in quantum theory. So here you are, you're changing relational variables exactly like you're doing and going from expressing um, variables in terms of one clock to expressing variables in terms of the other clock. So do you think that it's the same problem or it's a very related problem or is it such a different one? And it, in the first case, how much do you think the, the, the mathematics you're using is, is it goes through and is connected to what people do in that case. Yeah, so the mathematics I, I cannot comment uh, because there are some, so even though I was arguing for the similarities between different approaches, there are also some differences which make it harder to translate some concepts from one framework to the other. Uh, but I would say that the general um, problem is possibly related. So my impression is that there is a connection between these two views of how time flows. Because we can also, so I didn't show it, but there is also a time uh, counterpart to all this, uh, to all this reasoning, where you can, you, also, you can also apply it to time, to superpositions of time, to choosing a time parameter. Uh, I would guess that in, uh, uh, quantum gravity situations, you have additional problems because you're, because you're not, these are very simple systems overall. Um, so you might have some more technical difficulties in that case, 
but the concept like the conceptual problem at least should be related. Could, could you do, for instance, in, in, in your simple example with three, three particles, uh, could you do what is done in quantum gravity, namely use a larger Hilbert space uh, in which each one of the three particles has its own degrees of freedom, so, um, and then uh, sort of throw away the, the central, yeah. central mass. It's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, you, you just impose the sum of the momenta to be zero, yeah. and then you have a choice of going one, one, one to the other. So you have a you have a way of describing this sort of without choosing you know, and then going, going back. Yeah, so you can do something very similar with quantum reference frames. You can, um, so that's some work that I did uh, last year. So you can, uh, you have a system of n particles that are in a Newton potential basically, and you can write that as a constraint. You can write their dynamics as in, a, in a constrained fashion. And then additionally, you constrain the total P0, where you also, in the P0, you also include the internal energy of the clock. So these are clocks, basically, with external and internal degrees of freedom. You constrain the total energy and the total momentum. And then you can show that you have a reduction procedure to take the perspective of one of these clocks. And in this case, you find that the other clock, when you, when you take the perspective of one of these clocks, the other clocks uh, basically acquire the time dilation factor that is uh, well, the correct one that you would get from gravitational redshift, say. And it can also go in a superposition. So the, the way the time flows for the, from the perspective of these clocks to the perspective of the other clocks is basically rescaled by the gravitational time dilation, but since the clocks have a quantum state, this can be in a superposition. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Flaminia, for all the talk. I have a question. Um, in, in classical physics, when we look at reference frames, uh, we can understand the relation by a group of symmetry that relates them and which are characterized by some invariant, for instance, in special relativity, the line element, ds square. And that's a very clear way to describe the group of symmetry and the transformation, the change of reference frames. And so now in quantum reference frames, we have unitaries, which are acting on some bigger Hilbert space, which is somehow the, maybe the perspective neutral Hilbert space. And I, and I was wondering if there was a way to characterize similarly these unitaries in terms of some invariant quantity. So yeah, in, invariant I do not know, but the, for instance, in the relative superposition case, in each amplitude, the relative position is invariant when you change the quantum reference frame. Then I do not know what the what would play the role of a line element for for that, because you could can always have a quantum superposition of it. So I do not know how to reconcile it with an invariant quantity and not an operator. So the, if you if you really want a scalar quantity, then I don't know. Good. So, plenty of questions. Thank you so much, Flaminia. Thank Let's you. thank all together Flaminia for her lecture. So, it's time for the coffee break, and I take all with the breaks to give you more information, uh, practical information regarding the conference. First of all, Remember that um, uh, after uh, um, today's lectures, we have the reception uh, at the WAVE. The WAVE is just uh, the building in front of us there, so you will uh, find it easily, easily if you just uh, uh, go out from uh, the main door downstairs, and the reception starts at 6. Uh, some of you have signed up for uh, the observatory, uh, unfortunately, tonight uh, it's clouded. In principle, the visit uh, should have included also some uh, uh, society, uh, I mean, some <laughs> um, stars uh, 
um, siding, but uh, with this uh, clouds is not possible. On the other hand, the observatory will be open for us uh, to have just a tour of the observatory. So uh, between uh, 9 and 9.30, everybody uh, he's encouraged just to, to drop at the observatory and have a tour. There will be people welcoming you to, to guide you there. Um, as you may have seen, some people uh, have uh, ordered posters. They have arrived. So if your poster is not yet uh, up, please pick it up and put it uh, in, uh, in its place uh, to be viewed by the other participants. And one last communication. So we have the reception tonight. We have the conference dinner on Wednesday. And uh, uh, Tuesday and Thursday are free nights. On the other hand, uh, uh, we thought that uh, it could be nice to, to have some pre-booked spaces, uh, pre-booked restaurants, so people who want to join groups can go there. Um, so these are dinners that will, be, will pay by yourself, by each single person, but you can join groups and there are uh, lists on, uh, on the reception desk so that you can uh, sign up and, uh, and choose uh, to be part of one of those groups. Um, there are uh, Indicative prices uh, for those dinners, and uh, and yeah. So the most important thing is, uh, in, in particular, if you want to join uh, tomorrow's uh, dinners, uh, please sign uh, uh, today. Okay. So enjoy the coffee break. <laughs>